In the autumn of 1914, a true miracle occurred and was witnessed by many. As the German war machine smashed its way through Belgium and then France, brushing aside everything in its path, as the weary French and British armies, in full retreat and suffering enormous losses, were threatened with being completely overwhelmed, and with Paris about to fall into enemy hands, the German army, seemingly unstoppable and with victory in its grasp, was suddenly halted, and not only halted, but turned on its heels and sent into full retreat. No earthly force was capable of resisting the relentless advance of the disciplined and well-equipped German Empire as it swept all before it. The Belgians had been crushed, the British decimated, and the French were in disarray. Only divine intervention could hope to halt the Hun, and it did. On the outskirts of Paris, an angelic host descended to earth and blocked the Germans' path. The Germans, in dread fear and utter disarray, panicked and fled. Or so the story goes, nullius in verba. You may well not have heard of the Angel of Mons. It, like many of the stories from the war to end all wars, has been eclipsed by history, and by the many stories of atrocities, barbarism, conflict from the Second World War, and subsequent conflicts. But to a great extent it is the era of the First World War, and the treaties which ended it, that painted the map of the world which we now know. The First World War was also fought in a world before mass communication, before radio and television, where news was gleaned from a heavily censored press, or by word of mouth, rumour and gossip. Were the people of the time any more superstitious than today? Or did the upheaval, uncertainty and imminent threats they perceived simply drive their desires and imaginations into believing or accepting stories they might have otherwise dismissed? Or does the story of the Angel of Mons perhaps provide hard verifiable evidence that the supernatural exists and may at times intervene in this earthly realm? It was the story of the Angel of Mons which first rekindled my interest in the First World War. The war itself saw 37 million casualties, dead and wounded. We can add to the 17 million deaths, around 75 million deaths from the Spanish flu, which spread in a great part due to the upheavals of the war. To put these numbers in some context, the population of the USA in 1918 was around 100 million, and the world population about 1.8 billion. The war and the flu pandemic combined therefore killed around 1 in 20 of the world's population. Incidentally, the Spanish flu was so named because wartime censorship meant that accurate reports of the flu casualties were only released by neutral Spain, giving the impression of that country being the only one hit hard by the pandemic. But as always, I digress. Back to the story of the Angel of Mons and what this story might tell us about the supernatural world or perhaps about the human ability to accept as fact that which has not been verified if it serves some purpose useful to the desires of the individual. The Society for Psychical Research was founded in London in 1882. This was a serious endeavour with the stated aim to approach these varied problems without prejudice or prepossession of any kind, and in the same spirit of exact and unimpassioned inquiry which has enabled science to solve so many problems, once not less obscure nor less hotly debated. In the late 19th and early 20th century, business was booming for mediums, psychics, spiritualists, ghost hunters, and the like. The history of superstition is a topic for another day, but I would hope that it is evident how the First World War and the death it brought to so many families might drive people who would otherwise be disinclined to look for higher meaning or perhaps a glimpse beyond the veil so as to communicate with loved ones who had passed over. The Society's investigations would eventually contribute to a decline in popularity for mediums. They would also famously expose Helena Blavatsky as a fraud. Arthur Conan Doyle, inventor of the greatest of investigative sceptical minds, was very much a believer in the supernatural, possibly due to a very human desire which grew due to the deaths of his wife, son, brother, two brothers-in-law and two nephews. Conan Doyle firmly believed that his good friend, Harry Houdini, possessed supernatural powers. Houdini, the James Randi of his day, could not disabuse Conan Doyle of this delusion, and they eventually fell out over this and Houdini's exposing of mediums, including Marjorie Crandon of vaginal ectoplasm fame. 
Conan Doyle, who accepted the Cottingley fairies as fact, also fell for the Piltdown Man hoax. Whilst he was hardly alone in this, he has also been proposed, along with many others, as the perpetrator of the hoax. Eventually, he led a mass exodus from the Society for Psychical Research, which he had joined looking for proofs, because he felt they were opposed to spiritualism as a result of their continued exposure of fakes and frauds. I bring the Society to your attention because many of their publications are available at archive.org, and in July 1915, they published a brief piece on the story of the Angel of Mons titled Alleged Visions on the Battlefield. A large number of inquiries have reached us as to the authenticity of the alleged visions of angels, etc., seen on the battlefields in France, and in many cases the inquirers have sent us copies of accounts that have appeared in a number of newspapers, parish magazines, etc., Practically all these accounts are identical, beginning, Last Sunday I met Miss M, daughter of the well-known Canon M, and she told me she knew two officers, both of whom had themselves seen the angels. On first receiving the account, we wrote to Miss M, asking if she could put us into communication with these officers. She replied, I cannot give you the names of the men referred to in your letter of May 26th, as the story I heard was quite anonymous, and I do not know who they were. It thus appears that the account was repeated and circulated on purely hearsay evidence. In December 1915, the Society returned to the story with a lengthy article titled An Inquiry Concerning the Angels at Mons. They report that the tide of rumour surrounding the angels was at its height in May and June 1915, and that they have been able to trace most of the reports they have received back to a single article which first appeared in the All Saints Clifton Parish magazine for May 1915, from that article. Last Sunday I met Miss M, daughter of the well-known Canon M, and she told me she knew two officers, both of whom had themselves seen the angels who saved our left wing from the Germans when they came right upon them during the retreat from Mons. They expected annihilation, as they were almost helpless, when to their amazement they stood like dazed men, never so much as touched their guns, nor stirred, till we had turned around and escaped by some crossroads. One of Miss M's friends, who was not a religious man, told her that he saw a troop of angels between us and the enemy. He has been a changed man ever since. The other man she met in London. She asked him if he had heard the wonderful stories of angels. He said he had seen them himself and under the following circumstances. While he and his company were retreating, they heard the German cavalry tearing after them. They saw a place where they thought a stand might be made with sure hope of safety, but before they could reach it, the German cavalry were upon them. They therefore turned round and faced the enemy, expecting nothing but instant death, when to their wonder they saw between them and the enemy a whole troop of angels. The German horses turned round terrified and regularly stampeded. The men tugged at their bridles, while the poor beasts tore away in every direction from our men. This officer swore he saw the angels, which the horses saw plainly enough. This gave them time to reach the little fort, or whatever it was, and save themselves. The article goes on to say that they had received many reports ascribed to various authors, but the content makes them feel justified to state that they all originate from this original piece. As previously stated, the piece in the magazine claims that Miss M knew the two officers who saw the angels, but when the society contacted Miss M, she stated that the stories were anonymous. We might choose to dismiss the story as mere hearsay, but the Society's article then goes on to discuss another piece which the Vicar of All Saints sent to the Society with the Miss M letter. This time a Miss E. W. tells the story she got from Miss Leonard concerning a nurse who learned about the angels from a wounded British soldier. This time the soldier gave the nurse the names and addresses of seven soldiers, including officers, and the nurse was able to authenticate the story. The Society then compares these with a separate letter they received from a Mrs. S. This letter appears to be identical to the story of the nurse, apart from the fact that the story is now attributed to Miss M., the canon's daughter. The Society wrote to Miss Leonard, who passed them on to another lady, but no reply had been received. This article also details a piece in the Daily Mail of August the 24th, 1915, concerning the sworn affidavit 
of Private Robert Cleaver of the 1st Cheshire Regiment, who was at Mons and saw the angels with his own eyes. The Daily Mail had followed this on September the 2nd, 1915, with a further piece detailing further investigations, which showed that Private Cleaver had not left for France until the 6th of September, and so was unlikely to have seen an angel there in August, despite his sworn testimony. The Society for Psychical Research then mentions, for the second time, a little story called The Bowman, written by Arthur Macken and published in the Evening News on September the 29th, 1914. Arthur Macken is best known for his wonderful story, The Great God Pan, which Stephen King stated was one of the best horror stories ever written, maybe the best in the English language. Anywho, in 1915, The Bowman was printed in book form, with a foreword by Macken explaining all. At the end of August 1914, the news from the front was grim indeed. Macken, a journalist on the London Evening News, concocted a story drawing on Kipling's The Lost Legion with a large dose of the Battle of Agincourt as immortalised in Shakespeare's Henry V. The Bowman was printed as fiction but written as fact, as fiction often is. It is a very patriotic piece. Tommy is in trouble and about to be overwhelmed by the Bosch when all of a sudden one of the soldiers, having prayed, begins to hear strange voices. And as the soldier heard these voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes, with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another shout their cloud of arrows flew singing and tingling through the air toward the German hosts. Of course the German advance was halted, and ten thousand dead Germans with no visible wounds were left behind. The story, Macken explains, was a hit. Several parish magazines requested permission to reprint the story, and then, in perhaps April 1915, he was asked by one parish priest for precise details of who gave him the story of the bowman in the first place. Macken responded that the work was pure fiction, only to be told by the priest that he, Macken, the author, was mistaken, and that the story must be veridical, if slightly elaborated on. Macken goes on to say how the story then snowballed, and he became aware of various variations in circulation, all claimed as factual events. The angel, or angels, of Mons, as the story eventually morphed itself, was big news for some time. It is perhaps understandable that it spread so quickly in a Britain that was trying to come to terms with a deadly war which seemed to touch every family, with those left at home turning to the supernatural and religion for solace and meaning. The church, otherwise at a loss to explain or justify the slaughter, were not going to pour water on anything which increased their weekly congregation, and the government were in no hurry to refute anything which improved the morale of a depressed nation. The Angel of Mons gets a mention in Richard Attenborough's excellent 1969 film Oh What a Lovely War, and can still be found, defended as fact, on websites today. We all know only too well how someone's need to believe can encourage them to suspend healthy scepticism. The simple fact is that there are no diaries which detail this miracle. There are no official reports with unexplained mass deaths of troops or enemy, allied or German. And whilst the First World War might be lost in the mists of time to many of us, the advances and retreats, successes and defeats have been analysed in great detail, and there is nothing which suggests of a supernatural explanation. I have mentioned in a previous video the utter exhaustion of the British Expeditionary Force as they fought a running retreat covering 250 miles in two weeks with little sleep, little food, and with many of them experiencing the literal decimation of their platoons, companies, and regiments. Troops were sleeping as they marched, some missing bends in the roads and marching straight into ditches only to fall asleep the moment their bodies came to rest. It's difficult to imagine such a state of utter physical and mental exhaustion, where a body has been running on adrenaline alone for much longer than is healthy for it. As reported in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, Arthur Macken did receive a letter, which he published in the Evening News on September 14th, 1915, which expresses it quite well. The letter was from a lieutenant colonel, now at the front, who had fought through the retreat from Mons and been involved in the battle at Le Cateau, the heaviest battle during the retreat, involving 40,000 men, or half, of the British Expeditionary Force, with fully one-fifth of them killed, wounded, or captured. In the Colonel's words, On August 26, 1914, was fought the Battle of La Cateau. 
We came into action at dawn and fought till dusk. We were heavily shelled by the German artillery during the day, and in common with the rest of our division, had a bad time of it. Our division, however, retired in good order. We were on the march all night of the 26th, and on the 27th with only about two hours sleep. The brigade to which I belonged was rearguard to the division, and during the 27th we took up a great many different positions to cover the retirement of the rest of the division, so that we had very hard work, and by the night of the 27th we were all absolutely worn out with fatigue, both bodily and mental fatigue. No doubt we also suffered to a certain extent from shock, but the retirement still continued in excellent order, and I feel sure that our mental faculties were still in good working condition. On the night of the 27th, I was riding along in the column with two other officers. We had been talking and doing our best to keep from falling asleep on our horses. As we rode along, I became conscious of the fact that in the fields on both sides of the road along which we were marching, I could see a very large body of horsemen. These horsemen had the appearance of squadrons of cavalry, and they seemed to be riding across the fields and going in the same direction as we were going, and keeping level with us. I did not say a word about it at first, but I watched them for about twenty minutes. The other two officers had stopped talking. At last one of them asked me if I saw anything in the fields. I then told him what I had seen. The third officer then confessed that he, too, had been watching these horsemen for the past twenty minutes. So convinced were we that they were real cavalry, that at the next halt one of the officers took a party of men to reconnoitre, and found no one there. The night then grew darker, and we saw no more. The same phenomenon was seen by many men in our column. Of course, we were all dog-tired and overtaxed, but it is an extraordinary thing that the same phenomenon should be witnessed by so many different people. I myself am absolutely convinced that I saw these horsemen, and I feel sure that they did not exist only in my imagination. Another letter also published in the evening news on August 11, 1915, from a Lance Corporal A. Johnston, reads... We had almost reached the end of the retreat, and after marching a whole day and night, with but one half hour's rest in between, we found ourselves on the outskirts of Longy, near Paris, just at dawn, and as the day broke, we saw in front of us large bodies of cavalry, all formed up into squadrons, fine big men on massive charges. I remember turning to my chums in the ranks and saying, Thank God, we're not far off Paris now, look at the French cavalry. They too saw them quite plainly, but on getting closer, to our surprise, the horsemen vanished and gave place to banks of white mist with clumps of trees and bushes dimly showing through them. When I tell you that hardened soldiers who had been through many a campaign were marching quite mechanically along the road and babbling all sorts of nonsense in sheer delirium, you can well believe we were in a fit state to take a row of beanstalks for all the saints in the calendar. Obviously, they did see cavalry. We do not see with our eyes, but with our brains. Our eyes simply receive electromagnetic waves, photons, with no colour, shape or dimensionality. It is our brain interpreting signals from our retina, interpreted based upon our experiences and other sensory inputs, which include our imagination, which paint the pictures we say that we see. And of course, we do not require our eyes to see at all. If that seems a contradiction, then explain your last dream to yourself when your eyes were closed in a dark room. The inquiry in the journal goes on. You can read it for yourself. Other inquiries have followed over the years, including the 2004 book, which first alerted me to the story. The Angel of Mons by David Clark reaches, I think, the same conclusion as me. Having looked into the story of the Angel of Mons, all of the third-hand stories, despite their claimed provenance, originate after Arthur Mackin's original newspaper piece, The Bowman, was published on September the 29th, 1914. Those who want to believe that an angel appeared during the retreat from Mons, did what it came to do, and then disappeared again just as quickly, will continue to believe it without question. The sceptical mind, intrigued by the story, will search the available evidence to see if there are any aspects of the story which defy a natural explanation. Which are you? Thank you, as always, for watching.